Vever is an import company that makes cheap stuff. And a dirty little secret of YouTube is that Vever is extremely aggressive in their lobbying of content creators to review their products. I get emails from Vever multiple times a month asking me to review multiple products. Most of the time they have nothing to do with knife making. No, I do not want to review a concrete mixer or a paint sprayer or anything like that. I'm a knife maker Vever. However, in this case, they offered to send me their largest and hardest anvil, which I could not turn down because there are two things in life a man can never have enough of. The first is freedom. And the second are anvils. So the major motivation for this review is that there are a lot of hobbyists out there looking to get into the art and craft of knife making, but can't afford a large American made or antique anvil. And the question is, can one of these import anvils do a good enough job to get you in the game? So that's what we're gonna be trying to figure out today for sure. Now, full disclosure here, Vever did send me this anvil for free and the links in the description below are affiliate links that the channel does get a kickback on. So keep that in mind if you use them. In order to properly test an anvil, it first needs to be mounted. And to do that, we're gonna be spending the first large section of this video building a very beefy stand to mount this anvil on. After we have the anvil mounted, we'll be giving some initial impressions of the anvil before use. I'll do a hardness test with hardness files of the face of the anvil. We'll do a rebound test with ball bearings, and then we're gonna start using it. So with that, let's get to building. I ended up drafting my design in Fusion 360 so I can get an idea of how much material I'll need to order. I put the CAD files on my Patreon for free and we'll link to them below. The three legs of my stand will be 2 by 3 by 8 of an inch rectangular tube. The base plate is 12 by 12 by 3 quarters of an inch thick and the feet are going to be 1 half of an inch thick. I cut the legs at approximately 10 degrees which I feel gives a decent balance of stability and workshop floor space savings. For instance, 5 degrees can make the stand tippy and 20 degrees could kick the legs out really far yielding a tripping hazard. In each of the feet, I drilled a 5 8 of an inch hole since this is the ideal size for one half of an inch concrete slab mounting hardware. I don't plan on mounting this stand currently, but I want to have that option open in the future. I clamped the front leg in place with a fireball square, tacked the four corners, and then laid down my main welds with my Hobart 140 handler. I ended up going with a 51 degree angle on the other two legs, but 45 degrees would have worked just fine. The legs are kicked out a little less with 51 degrees, but just be aware this angle taken into the extreme will reduce the stability of the stand. With the relatively light weight of this anvil, these leg braces aren't necessary. However, I figured if I ever used this stand to mount a heavier anvil, it would be nice to have them installed. I'm going to be filling up these legs with sand, but before I do, I want to make sure that they sit nice and flat on these feet. If I were to weld this up as is, I could have some gaps here and there that would get filled in with the weld, and I would know that all three of the feet are nice and flat with each other. But since this thing's gonna be flipped upside down and I'm gonna be putting this foot onto the tube, the cut on the tube will dictate how flat the foot is. So if I'm off here and there, you'll see some gaps under this foot as it's sitting on the floor. This probably doesn't matter that much, but I just wanted to make sure I have it as flat as possible. So I went around this guy and I marked off some spots to grind, remove some material, uh, which are opposite of the gap. So you can see on this one, there's a little bit of a gap at the front. So I'm gonna remove some material across the back and across the whole back so that this sits a little bit more flat onto the foot. And then we'll continue on. You can see what I'm talking about on this other foot over here. We have uh, a little bit of contact over here and no contact over here. So. I'll grind away a little bit of this side so that this sits a little flatter. All right, I may really be overthinking this now, but instead of doing what I was just doing with the angle grinder, trying to get it just perfect and then flip it over and put the feet on after I fill them with sand, 
I think I'm going to fill the legs with sand and then try to find a way to hold the sand in the legs, flip it back over and weld the feet on nice and flat on my table. I'm not exactly sure how I'll hold the sand in the legs, but I have a few ideas. So let's see if I could figure this out. Before starting the leg filling, I squirted some 20 weight oil into the legs to prevent rusting in the future. I then started filling the legs with play sand while throwing some more oil in there as I went. My solution for holding the sand in the legs while flipping the assembly was to tack in some thin inserts into the ends. This worked okay, but I could see some gaps where the sand could get out, so I filled in those gaps with JB Weld. This did allow me to flip the stand while keeping the sand in the legs. However, it's probably not the ideal method since the burning of the JB weld during my welding caused some issues. If doing this again, I would probably do what Alex Steele did and just drill additional holes in the base plate of my stand to fill the legs from the top after the stand is constructed. The anvil from Vever has two mounting locations that I plan to take advantage of on the front and the rear. I drilled and tapped the 3 quarters of an inch base plate for 3 8 by 16 bolts. As a side note, these drill taps are worth every penny and I'll be buying more of them in multiple sizes for my shop. Using some scrap quarter inch thick angle, I made these front and rear brackets to distribute the clamping power of my 3 8 fasteners over the foot of the anvil. After the test fit, I painted the stand. To mount the anvil, I laid down a bed of silicone first in order to attempt to fill as many irregularities as possible and better mesh the anvil with the stand. So the stand is complete. It came in at a weight of 81 pounds. The anvil came in at a weight of 130 pounds and my old anvil was 107 pounds. So I'm getting a little bit more poundage here. Uh, you can see them side by side. There's a pretty big height difference on the stands. The old stand that I've been working on has really been too tall and I've noticed that in the past and actually stood on a step to get the right height with my hammer swings. So I think I'm really gonna like the slightly shorter uh, face of the anvil native on the stand. Another thing that's pretty obvious is side by side, this is much larger. I think part of the reason why this looks so much larger is because there's a space in the middle here where there's no casting. It has an arch in the center of its legs and this one's solid. So uh, that, that gives you a little bit more material to use across the top of the anvil and be around the same weight. Before testing, I wanna give some thoughts on the anvil as it sits now unused. Uh, first and foremost, I really like how flat the top is. This is uh, one thing that I'm most excited for my old heirloom quality anvil over here uh, that's been passed down in my family has seen better days in the face and I'm doing finer work now that I very much like a flat surface. So this is nice. I rounded over the corners, uh, probably really small radiuses back here. And then as you get closer to the horn, uh, I rounded it over a little bit more. So this is kind of the hard work section of the anvil. There is an online resource called Anvil Fire that talks about these different radiuses and I will put the link to that on the screen. I cleaned up the horn. I didn't spend a ton of time here making this uh, mirror polished finish. It could be done. Just know that the casting is a little rough on this anvil's body. Uh, it's, a, it's a cheap anvil, so that is to be expected. I didn't see any big voids in the castings, uh, but Note that it would take some significant time to put a mirror polish on the top of this anvil horn. Not impossible. I may do it in the future, but right now it just has a 
a fairly rough paint removed finish. The edges of the hardy hole are extremely sharp and jagged. I'm going to come in here with an angle grinder and put a chamfer all the way around that hardy hole. The Pritchard hole also has some rough corners, which I will clean up. With the initial thoughts out of the way, we can get on with the testing. I will be using some hardness files to test the face of the anvil to see if we really are around 55 Rockwell. I'll be using this large ball bearing to do a rebound test with some slow motion camera footage. And then uh, surely we'll be making a knife. So let's get started. Alrighty, onto the hardness files. I picked these up from Amazon in order to give us a decent idea of how hard this anvil is. Vever advertises the anvil as having a 55 Rockwell hardness face, opposed to their blue colored anvils that have a 50 Rockwell hardness face. The files work up in fairly large increments of 5, so we'll only be able to get a range here. The 40, 45, and 50 files all skated across the face without digging in at all, and that was expected. I was happy to see that the 55 Rockwell file also skated across the face of the anvil, indicating that the hardness is at least 55 or greater. I went ahead and tried out the 60 Rockwell file and it clearly dug into the face of the anvil, so this verifies to me that the anvil is between 55 and 60 on the Rockwell hardness scale. Yeah. I did the same testing on my antique anvil and got the same range of 55 to 60 Rockwell. So as far as hardness goes, Vever did a good job with this anvil. So the Anvil Fire website has a ton of data on 10 inch drop test with a one inch ball bearing on different materials, different anvils. So that's what I'm gonna be doing on this anvil. To get good footage of it, I actually clamped a ruler to the side of the anvil. I'm not sure how this will affect the test. I don't think it will, but just know that I have a clamp holding this ruler on the anvil. And then I have a camera right in front of the ball bearing drop uh, that is as flat and perpendicular to the face of the anvil as possible. So hopefully we'll get some good footage. I'll show it to you in real time first, and then we'll look at the tape. So the testing went pretty good here. I was able to get the footage onto my computer and make some measurements to get a percent rebound. I plotted the data from anvilfire.com on this graph as well in order to give you an idea of where the Vever anvil lands in comparison. This Vever 130 pounder came in with an average rebound of 71.7%, which is better than some of the lower quality cast anvils or the common beginner anvil, a section of railroad rail. It did score worse than some of the other higher end anvils on this graph, even though the face is likely around the same hardness, which leads me to believe the rebound of the Vever anvil suffers from the arch in the base design. If I were to give some feedback to Vever, I'd likely recommend removing that arch, even if it means sacrificing some of the length and width of the face of the anvil. While we're here, I also tested my antique Isaac and Nash 107 pounder. And depending on which section of the face I dropped the ball on, I got high marks on rebound, which is to be expected. The variability here is due to the ball bearing getting deflected by humps and gashes in the anvil's face, so this average of 79.8 is likely really supposed to be in the low 80s. One of these days I plan to get this anvil over to a professional to lightly surface the face and flatten out some years of abuse. Overall, I feel as though a 71.7% rebound is still pretty decent. This anvil has the hallmarks of being a good and serviceable starter anvil, and we're going to see what it can do in action. Now I'm going to preface this by saying I am not an accomplished smith, and I have a ton to learn in regards to blacksmithing and bladesmithing. The first thing we'll be making is a little hook out of a quarter inch bar. I forgot to say earlier that the size of this hardy hole is around 1 and an eighth by 1 and an eighth, which is slightly larger than the cutoff tool I made a bit ago for my other anvil. But that's okay, I got this stock cut just fine. While my hook is mediocre, the anvil did a good job here staying stable. So now it's time to forge a knife. I'm starting off with a quarter inch bar of 1080 that's around 1.5 inches wide. 
The first thing to do here is to forge down the tip. This went pretty well, however, I think this would have been a good application for a larger hammer. The hammer I'm using right now is an old 2.5 pound ball peen hammer, and I think I could move some more steel with a 4.5 pounder. You can see a little scooting around of the anvil in the stand since it's not mounted to the slab, but for the most part, I feel like it was a solid platform. I worked a tip over the side of the anvil and actually cut off this little nub with my hot cut hardy on the other anvil. Looking at the shape now, the section that looks like it would be the edge will actually end up being the spine. When I start forging the bevels, it will curve the tip up to around the center. I flipped everything around to start isolating where I want my ricasso to be. Since I have a press, I cheated and used it to set my ricasso. I then made sure everything was nice and flat before starting on the bevels. Here I'm starting the bevels by utilizing the near side edge of the anvil. I'll work these all the way up the edge towards the tip. Using a 2x4 as a wood swacker, I straighten out my spine and then cut off the excess of the tank. All that's left to do on this rough form is to taper down the tang to where I want it and then anneal the blade in the forge as it cools down. So this is what we ended up with. I plan on finishing out this knife in a future video, so stay tuned to the channel if you want to see what it turns into. After finishing up, I cleaned down the anvil using some WD-40 and a little 320 grit sandpaper to remove some grime from the face. It does look like I picked up a few shallow dings here and there on the face of the anvil. I'm pretty sure these are largely due to the ball bearing test I did on the anvil, some of which were from a higher drop than the 10 inches. I went over to my antique Isaac and Nash anvil and saw some of the same divots, so this comes down to user error on the high altitude bearing drops, not a bad anvil face. Alrighty guys, so to me, this is a perfectly good usable anvil. Nothing felt weird today when forging that hook and knife on it, and I'll continue to use it in the shop going forward. So if you wanna watch the progress of this anvil, make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel. I will catch y'all on the flip side.